Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I wonder how much longer we're all gonna keep saying that. Um, I'm Barbie Zelizer, Director of the Center for Media at Risk, and I'm really delighted to introduce today's organizer and moderator, Sophie Maddox. Um, an Annenberg PhD student and a Center Steering Committee member, Sophie may be more at the beginning of her progression to degree than at the end, but in the short time she's been here, she has been single-handedly responsible for orienting the Center toward feminism, misogyny, uh, non-consensual uh, pornography, and image-based sexual abuse. She is a whirlwind of energy, um, already the author of three published manuscripts, and recipient of a Fulbright uh, 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 scholarship. She's also received a top paper award from the International Communication Association, multiple awards from the New School and the University of Cambridge, um, where she was before coming to Annenberg, and the prestigious Penn Provost Graduate Academic Engagement Fellowship uh, with the Netter Center for Community Partnerships. When Sophie tackles an issue, it's game over, and I mean that in a very good way. Uh, please welcome Sophie Maddox as she moderates Sex, Power, and Democracy, What Could a Biden-Harris Administration Achieve for Reproductive Rights? Thank you so much, Barbie and Poppy, um, for those really such kind and generous words, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to moderate this panel. Um, and welcome everyone. We're going to have around 40 minutes of, of discussion in our panel and then we will open up to audience questions, um, which will be run via the Zoom chat window. Um, but without further ado, I'm, I'm really excited to introduce our panelists um, and get going. Um, so we have two panelists today, uh, Galina Espinoza and Amani Gandhi, who are both joining us from Rewire News Group. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about them both. Um, Galina is the president and editor in chief of Rewire News Group which is the only nonprofit media organization exclusively dedicated to reporting on reproductive and sexual health rights and justice. An award-winning media executive and journalist, Galena has held previous leadership roles at NBC Universal, People and Latina, and worked in every form of news, including print, digital, television streaming, and podcasting. She has interviewed world figures, including President Barack Obama and former Housing and Urban Development Secretary Julian Castro, and her personal essays have appeared in the New York Times, USA Today, and Marie Claire. Galena is also a member of the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, and has appeared on virtually every major morning show and news network, including The Today Show, MSNBC, and CNN, and spoken on panels at prestigious events such as South by Southwest and the New York Latino Film Festival. And in conversation with Galena, we have um, Imani Gandhi, who is senior editor of Law and Policy for Rewire News Group, where she covers law and courts and co-hosts the podcast Boom Lawyered, of which I'm a major fangirl. Um, Amani also began and continues to write the Angry Black Lady Chronicles. Amani is a recovering attorney turned award-winning journalist and political blogger. Previously, Amani founded Angry Black Lady Chronicles, winner of the 2010 Black Weblog Award for Blog to Watch and the 2012 Black Weblog Award for Best Political Blog. She received her JD from the University of Virginia School of Law in 2001, where she was a Hardy Cross Dillard Scholar and an editorial board member of the University of Virginia Law Review. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, I think we've put your Twitter handles in the chat so everyone can, can follow you if they don't already. Um, and welcome. Thank, Thank you, you Sophie. We're so thrilled to be here, yeah. Awesome. Um, so in this panel, we're going to discuss um, sex, power and democracy and really to kind of dig into what a Biden-Harris administration could achieve um, for reproductive rights and gender justice. But I wanted to start by asking you both about Rewire, um, and we're going to put a link to Rewire's website in the chat. Um, Rewire in the last few years has become a really essential staple of my media diet um, in many ways, from the newsletter to the excellent writing on sex ed and sexual health, um, to the podcast, uh, Boom Lloyd, which Imani co-hosts. So as a foreigner, that podcast has really taught me everything I know about the US legal system. And so my first question to you both is, is what's Rewire's mission and what does Rewire offer that's really lacking in mainstream news coverage of, of sex and power? Well, Sophie, as you called out, we are the only media organization dedicated to reporting on these issues, reproductive and sexual health rights and justice. And you may wonder why is there a need for a dedicated um, media outlet on these issues? Isn't mainstream media 
coverage enough? Well, I would ask you to take a look at what we've experienced these last four years in terms of the rise of misinformation and disinformation. We now live in a world of alternative facts. Um, we now live in a world of fake news. But what's important to note is that while this new landscape may feel surprising to most folks who have not experienced it before, this has been the story about what's happening in the reproductive health space going back at least a decade. In fact, it's the very reason why Rewire News Group was founded, to fight back against misinformation on our issues, which all too often are told through a political lens or in a very misleading way that has real life consequences. And I'll give you one example of that, um, which is the simplest example that I can think of because there are so many ways in which um, there's real harm being done by false narratives on our issues. But a couple of years ago, the Guttmacher Research Institute, Institute did an analysis of um, different websites that um, offer up sexual um, health content. And um, it looked at more than 180 websites and it found that nearly half of the websites had inaccurate information about contraception on that. Now think about it, you're searching for information about birth control. This is a really vital um, piece of information. You don't want to have inaccurate information. You don't want to get this wrong. Think of the implications of that. And yet nearly half of the websites offering this information are putting out false information, whether deliberate or not. And so when you think about it that way, you realize that the need for fact-based reporting on these issues is incredibly vital and incredibly important. And that's really what we're here to do. Thank you so much. I, and I wonder if, if Amani, you wanted to elaborate on any of the kind of the things that drew you to rewire or, or, or how rewire kind of um, changed uh, the landscape. Yeah, I mean, initially I was hired by Rewire to develop uh, the legislative tracker that we have, which has all of the anti-choice legislation from 2013 to 2020. So that's seven solid years of just tracking all of the bills that were introduced, all of the bills that were passed and joined current. And I just found it really important that there was no such a space. There was no place that no central hub that people could go to, to figure out what was going on in their backyard. And so um, when I was hired by Rewire, it was to do that project. And I thought that that was a pretty groundbreaking thing. Also at the time, I was woefully unemployed and thinking that I could make a living as a blogger, which spoiler alert, you cannot. So <laughs> it came, you know, this job came for me at a really important time where I was just switching from private practice into, you know, being what, what I, being a journalist, trying my hands at journalism. And so I've really Rewire has given me the space to grow as a journalist. And I think that's really important. Um, and I think between um, me and Jessica Mason Piclo, my work spouse slash colleague, you know, the two of us are the only journalism team that are covering reproductive rights, abortion rights law in the country, um, in the United States. Oh no, looks like we're having a technical issue. <laughs> so I will just build on what I'm sure Imani was going to say, which is that, you know, one of the most alarming um, areas of misinformation really that, oh, sorry, Imani, sorry. are you back? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I, I appreciate, you know, what Rewire has done for me and what Rewire has done for, you know, reproductive rights generally. Imani, I was starting to say that one of the most alarming areas of misinformation um, when we're reporting on our issues is in um, the pieces of legislation we look at and how many of them are actually rooted not only in lies, but in medical impossibilities by folks who are not doctors and who don't understand um, basic biology and how the human body works. Imani, a couple of years ago, in fact, broke a story about a legislator um, I believe in the Midwest, and Amani, I'll let you speak about this in more detail, who introduced a bill concerning ectopic pregnancies, which is when the fetus is developing outside of, of the womb, and somehow seemed to think that it was possible to re-implant the fetus um, inside the womb, which is just not even possible, um, and was trying to legislate based on just complete medical impossibility as yet um, a particularly egregious example of, of the kinds of, um, you know, non-scientific um, actions that are, that are taken um, when it comes to legislating abortion. I don't know, Mani, if you want to speak about that story at all. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you you got it right. It was in Ohio, and just this man thought that you could reimplant ectopic pregnancies, which is not a thing you can do. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, Jessica and I have been covering these medication abortion reversal um, bills, which posit that you can reverse a medication abortion after you take the initial pill if you take if you get an injection of hormones. This is absolute bunk science. The studies that they that the quote unquote studies that were conducted were based on you know, sample sizes of seven people. It's absolutely not possible to reverse an abortion, but the, these medication abortion reversal bills are now making their ways overseas. So a lot of what you know, the Christian right is, and, and evangelical right are able to do here, they end up in, you know, exporting our terrible abortion policies overseas. And I think that you know, makes what goes on in this country a global issue. So when you combine the lack of attention paid by mainstream media outlets to these issues and the amount of misinformation that, that propagates these issues, um, you see the reason why there's a need for an organization like Rewire News Group that delivers fact-based reporting on these important issues. Thank you both so much. I think it's so kind of alarming to hear about this complete uh, misinformation, disinformation um, that's been propagated for so long. And, and I see Rewire as being really on the front lines of this fight. Um, and it's really interesting to hear you kind of reporting back from the front lines about the things that you're constantly debunking in your, in your writing every day. Uh, and I wanted to ask, you know, you've alluded to some of the biggest kind of um, areas of misinformation and disinformation, but, but what role has the mainstream media kind of played in colluding with this and, and in polarizing the abortion debate? Um, and how has this developed under the Trump administration as well? So I'm so glad to hear you use the word polarizing because it gives me the opportunity to talk about, to debunk one of my favorite myths, which is that abortion is a polarizing issue. Um, I, it's completely reasonable that most folks think that abortion is a polarizing issue based on the way that it is reported in the mainstream media. Um, but here are the facts. The facts are that 70% of Americans believe that abortion should be legal most or all of the time, 70%. I would challenge you to find any other issue in America right now that 70% of folks agree on. I mean, it's a really clear majority. Um, even when you start to look at folks, um, people of faith, um, which is a conversation that's come up a lot since the election of, of, of President Biden as a Catholic president, um, the Pew Research Center last year um, did a poll of Catholics and more than half of them also believe that abortion should be legal in most or all cases. So there's a real disconnect between the reality of the way most Americans feel about abortion and what we do see reported and what has emerged as the prevailing narrative, which is that abortion is a divisive issue. It's not a divisive issue. Um, so why is it um, that so many folks believe that it is? Well, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, the um, uh, NARAL Pro-Choice actually last year did an analysis. They hired an outside research group to analyze the way abortion is covered in the media. And what was most striking to me and what explains why abortion is seen as polarizing is that 80% of media outlets cover abortion through either the political team or the legal team. They do not cover abortion as a healthcare issue. They cover it as a political issue. So when you wanna talk about how does an issue become politicized? Well, it starts by reporting it through the lens of a political reporter. Even more striking was that in the analysis of, of the stories that they looked at, 65% of stories quoted a politician. Only 14% of stories quoted a doctor and fewer than 10% quoted a patient. So you almost have this, kind of, so when you think about the narrative, the narrative around abortion is completely a political narrative. Um, and yet it is a medical procedure that's either performed in a doctor's office or that you get um, a prescription from a doctor for um, medication abortion. And yet um, it is not in any way rooted in healthcare when it is covered by the mainstream media. So that's why it's why it's become so politicized in part. That's why it's viewed as so polarizing because it's only ever reported through that lens. And I think there's a real challenge um, that we have in flipping that narrative and starting to center patients and providers at the center of that narrative. But I would actually challenge all organizations to look at how they are covering an abortion and start to shift the thinking um, toward it being a healthcare issue, which is 100% what it is. And just further to, to Galena's point, um, 
you know, when you talk about the polarizing nature of abortion, you, you're, you're usually talking about certain kinds of abortion, right? So the, the anti-choicers love to focus on later abortion, which is about 1.2% of the abortions that, that people have, but they like to focus on these later abortions because it just, it tugs at the heartstrings, right? The idea of a 28 week pregnant person deciding just willy nilly that they just don't wanna be pregnant anymore and just kidding, I'm gonna have an abortion, which is not something that happens, right? Like if you're 28 weeks pregnant or 25 or tw after 20, the likelihood that that you have the likelihood is that you have some sort of medical uh, condition, a fetal an anomaly. This is usually a wanted pregnancy that people are are terminating because their doctors are saying that that's best for their health, or they're saying that that is the most kind thing to do because forcing a person to give birth to a to a baby that is not going to live very long can also be seen as cruel, depending upon what the patient wants. And so what I find really interesting is thinking about the ways in which questions regarding ab abortion are posed, right? So when you are polling people about their feelings about abortion, the way you phrase the question can really change the outcome, can change the answer. So for example, there are six week bands, these quote unquote heartbeat bands. Well, first of all, embryos don't have heartbeats. They don't have cardiovascular systems. So right, right out of the gate, that's a way that the media is sort of cementing this, this anti-choice narrative about heartbeat bands. But besides that, if you, were to if you were to ask a person, do you think that abortion should be permitted after a fetus has a heartbeat? People might say, well, no, because then they're getting really close to a person and that just seems icky. But if you say to a person, if you explain to them that there is no cardiovascular system, that babies, that fetuses and embryos do not have heartbeats. And then you say, well, what if I told you that, that banning abortion at six weeks means that most people won't be able to get an abortion because most people don't know that they are pregnant at six weeks. So you're bas it's basically a total abortion ban, a ban. You're foreclosing that option for a lot of people. Well, the, the answer is going to change. Um, and similarly with, for example, the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits public funding for abortion, if you ask people, do you think taxpayer dollars should pay for someone's abortion? They might say, well, no, I don't want my taxpayer dollars going to that. But if you change the question and say, do you think that it's fair that the government is picking and choosing who can access healthcare based on how much money they have, then that question, then they say, well, no, that doesn't seem fair. You should be able to access all, you know, the panoply of healthcare services, irrespective of how much money you are or whether you're poor. So I think it's really important to focus on the ways in which we're framing these discussions in order to really get to the root of this quote, this, this purported polarization of the abortion issue. Thank you both so much. I know for the budding communication scholars in the room, the discussion of framing is going to be really useful for us in our in our um, in our research areas. I, I think it's really interesting to hear about this, like both kind of politicization and false polarization that's and the disinformation, misinformation, that the way these are all intersecting. And I wanted to sort of take a look back and ask you a question that's more historical to try and understand how we got here. Um, and I know that Rewire, Rewire last year produced this really fascinating podcast that in which the host kind of replayed and commented on the original Roe v. Wade decision in 1973. Um, for any who don't know, this decision was the Supreme Court ruling that constitutionally protects a pregnant woman's liberty to um, choose to have an abortion. Um, and I myself was like very surprised by many of the elements of this of hearing this court case. Um, and I wondered what how you think that that has really shaped contemporary um, abortion politics in the US um, and any kind of misrememberings or misconceptions people have about that decision? Well, I think one of the most, um, one of the really important things to, to focus on is that Roe versus Wade was about the legal right to an abortion. It didn't say anything about access to abortion. And that's critical because if you have a legal right to an abortion, but there's not an abortion clinic in your state or within hundreds and hundreds of miles and you're, you're poor and you already have kids and you have a job that won't allow you to take time off in order to get an abortion, then we start to talk about the ways in which poor people, primarily people of color, are foreclosed from the option entirely. And so Roe didn't do anything to address the sort of structural inequality, the racial inequality and the economic inequality that is inherent in, in the healthcare system, that is inherent in the reproductive healthcare system. And so, you know, the and I think that the pro-choice, the mainstream reproductive rights movement that sprang or sprung, sprang from, the, from Roe versus Wade sort of failed to address these inequalities. And so, I think that 
now with the with the reproductive justice framework, and we can talk about that a little bit more, but you know, it, the TLDR of reproductive justice is that it is the right to have children, the right not to have children, and then the right to parent any children you have in a safe and healthy environment. And so if we transfer our thinking from a legal right to an abortion to a, a, a mode of thinking that focuses on access and also which focuses on what happens to people after they have these babies, right? Do we just force people to have babies and then leave them off on their own? Or are we going to talk about things like universal health care, um, child care, uh, you know, all of these social safety net, social safety net, SNAP benefits, et cetera, that help people, that help young people or any people raise children that they have and do it in a way that they feel like they they can raise a kid that's going to live and be healthy. And so the great thing about reproductive justice is that it encompasses so many different kinds of what you would call social justice issues under this large umbrella, right? So reproductive justice includes climate justice and environmental racism, because if you're living in an impoverished neighborhood where there's you know, dumping going on two blocks away, then that's going to impact the, the, the healthfulness of your children. Um, for example, police brutality, right? We're in the middle of the Derek Chauvin trial. Police brutality is a major reproductive justice issue. And a lot of people don't think about it that way. They think about it as purely a racial justice issue. But if you, I, I've talked to so many black women over the years who have expressed real fear about having children and raising black children in this environment, because if you were raising a kid, especially if under, you know, ab under states with have abortion bans where you're forced to have a child and then you can't care for the child. And then that child is gunned down in the street by the police. And then those police officers are just not held accountable for it. That makes it really difficult to look at this country as a as a friendly birthing environment. And so I think, you know, the, the, the laser focus on legal rights in Roe, I think, was problematic to the extent that it really left out a huge swath of people for whom abortion access is necessary. Um, and then my my second major gripe with sort of um, Roe versus Wade and the conservative discourse around it is that they'll often say things like, well, there's no right to an abortion in the Constitution. So as if the Constitution enumerates all rights and the only rights that people have are listed in the Constitution. Well, that's absolute nonsense, right? For multiple reasons. One, the Supreme, Supreme Court develops jurisprudence that becomes part of the Constitution, that becomes part of the constitutional rubric. So the very fact that Roe versus that the Supreme Court said in Roe versus Wade that there was a legal right to an abortion up to a point means that it's constitutional. That's what they rule. The, the constitutional law is not simply what the Constitution says. It's also how the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution. Um, and so with respect to substantive due process rights, like substantive due process is are usually the rights that have to do with um, family, sex, childbirth, child rearing, birth control, same sex marriage, interracial marriage. That's substantive due process as opposed to procedural due process, due process, which is what we talk about when we think about Miranda rights and how police treat, treat you if you are incarcerated. But these substantive due process rights are not enumerated in the Constitution, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, and particularly if you look at the Ninth Amendment, which essentially says that all of the unenumerated rights are retained by the people, that means abortion, that means contraception, that means same-sex marriage, that means all of these, these sort of quote unquote cultural issues that have developed over the last 200 years that the framers did not contemplate. Those, it, I think it's crucial to recognize that the constitution is not set in amber. It's a living and breathing document that is interpreted by the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court says that there are, there's a right to privacy in the constitution and the right to an abortion or contraception stems from that right to privacy, then that's it. You know, we don't need to have a conversation about, well, it, you know, the framers didn't write the word abortion down in the constitution. And frankly, the reason why they didn't write, write the word abortion down in the constitution is because nobody cared. Nobody cared <laughs> in, you know, the 18th century about abortion. They didn't start caring until men at the, in the Amer American Medical Association decided that, you know, lady business was something that they should be concerned about. So they, it was really about stopping midwives and doulas and witches from, 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 from uh, providing abortion care, from providing reproductive health care. And so it's really so steeped in patriarchy. It's so steeped in racism, for example. You know, the culture war about abortion really started as a way to push back on segregation. 
because you know they because because they were white supremacists and patriarchs needed a way to fire people up against in, against integration and so what they did is they picked another issue that they could get people fired up about and that issue happened to be abortion nobody cared about abortion when the founders were alive so that that's a that's one thing that just really sort of gets on you know grinds my gears as the kids say the kids don't say that old, older folks say that. but you know in our podcast we'll hear arguments jessica and i really you know dug down into the actual arguments and found all kinds of things that were fascinating and interesting um and so yeah i would encourage any everyone to listen to that podcast it's a very short podcast you can probably knock it out in three hours and you learn a lot and you hear what the lawyer, the arguments that the lawyers were making and the sexism that was steeped in the arguments that they were making. And it's really eye-opening. So I think Amani has done an incredible job of kind of laying out just how interwoven um, abortion is with so many other issues and just how complex it all is and how um, systemic um, so much of what we're seeing um, is. Um, but for me, the real takeaway is that Roe v. Wade, the legal decision is not nearly enough. Um, and I think that for a long time, there was a bit of complacency or a bit of like, okay, we took care of that. Abortion is now legal. So we're all good, right? Um, but what we've seen, um, you know, uh, ever since then, and particularly in the last few years where we've seen this really, really picking up dramatically, is a chipping away at Roe in every conceivable fashion. Um, starting in January with the return of state legislatures, this has been the most active um, legislative session um, ever as relates to abortion, with literally hundreds of pieces of legislation introduced, all of which are aimed at restricting access in various ways. And I think that that's really what the concern is, that focusing on Roe is the wrong place to be focused right now. It's really what's happening at the state legislatures, um, including folks enacting laws that they know are outright unconstitutional, that they admit are unconstitutional, but that they are um, putting forth merely in the hopes of getting it all the way up to the Supreme Court, knowing that there is now a conservative majority on that court um, that may just be willing um, to give them what they're looking for, which is a rollback of, um, of abortion rights. Thank you both so much. I mean, there are so many threads I would love to pick up from those answers, <laughs> but for the sake of time, I would just kind of love to say one thing around this constitutional fundamentalism that Amani is kind of referring to that I think ties back to our discussion earlier about, about free speech and misinformation and disinformation and how it's all kind of part of this really powerful attempt to just pull from this really kind of alt-right uh, kind of um, fundamentalist reading of the constitution. Um, and in terms of Roe versus Wade, as Belina said, not being enough um, and being chipped away so aggressively, my next question is really kind of looking forward to um, what a, a Biden-Harris administration could do, especially um, in the wake of some really exciting new judicial nominees. Um, what do you both feel realistically um, could be accomplished um, in the reproductive rights space and the gender justice space under this administration? Uh, well, you know, Biden made a commitment that he uh, said that he was committed to repealing Hyde, the Hyde Amendment, which bars uh, federal funds from going to abortion unless it's in the case of rape or incest or life endangerment. And, you know, this is an amendment that is it's just quite simply discrimination. It discriminates against poor people in the delivery of health care services. And there's just there's there's no sensible reason for the government to be interfering in that way. If the government is going to provide a service, if they're going to say, we're going to provide health care to poor people under Medicaid, but no, we're not going to provide this particular service, when providing this particular service would actually help people not sink further into poverty, because there are studies that suggest that people who give who have babies who are not ready, who can't afford them, it sinks them further into poverty. And of course the government doesn't seem to be interested in helping people once that baby is birthed. So I think the repealing the Hyde Amendment is critical. Um, and it's also critical to repeal the Helms Amendment. There's a movement uh, among, um, um, among some democratic legislators in Congress to repeal the Helms Amendment. And the Helms Amendment um, is an amendment that says that, it's a provision that says that foreign assistant funds cannot be used 
to pay for the performance of abortion as a method of family planning. And this and this is overseas, right? So not only are we saying you can't use funds here to pay for abortion, we're also, if we give foreign aid to other countries, none of that money can be used for abortion. Ironically, that money can be used if you have an unsafe abortion and need medical care to fix the unsafe abortion. Seems to me it would make more sense just to allow that money to go to reputable, legal, safe abortion clinics so that people can get the care that they need. But you know, we are a very imperialist nation. We like to impose our values on other nations, even if those nations don't have those values, simply because we have the money to, to sort of throw our weight around and force other countries to, to do as we say. And the fact that this, particularly with, um, you know, the, the, the Mexico City policies, the policies that ban funds going to, to, to clinics or people that even refer someone to an abortion, I mean, this is just another, this is just another form of imperialism is what it is. It's another way that we as a country outsource our very conservative Christian right evangelical views into places that really desperately need healthcare. They really desperately need this sort of reproductive healthcare. So those are two things. The third thing, if we, we're going to get into the, the birth control benefit, the, the contraception mandate in the ACA, right? Obama passed um, Obama signed the ACA. The ACA includes provisions that were supposed to um, bring about equality in, in healthcare services delivered to men and to women. And part of that equality was to make birth control co-pay free, right? So if you are an employer and you offer health insurance to your employees, or if you're a school offering insurance to your students and employees, you have to offer birth control coverage. You have to include birth control coverage because studies show that insurers would much rather pay for contraception than have to pay for birth. It's much cheaper to just hand out birth control pills than to, than to, to birth babies. And, and frankly, it is, I think it's inappropriate for employers, unless you're a church, like legitimately a church, I think it is inappropriate for, for example, for for-profit companies to couch themselves as religious organizations somehow, like Hobby Lobby, where they sell yarn and crafts, is somehow a religious organization. That's nonsense to me. What you're doing is you're imposing your views, your religious views, onto people who may not adhere to those views. And we saw under the Trump administration that not only was he willing to provide religious exemptions to people who have religious opposition to, um, to birth control because they think it's an abortifacient, they think it causes abortions, which it absolutely does not, but so we see that these, these corporations don't want to, to they, they want to use their religious beliefs to, to, to exempt themselves from birth control. But Trump also said, now you can just say, I'm, more, I'm morally opposed to it. So it does, you don't even have to couch it in any sort of religious terms in any sort of terms that the constitution protects, right? You can just say, I'm morally opposed to, to, abort, uh, to birth control. And then that's it. That can't be right. We cannot permit people to impose their religious views on other people. And that's what these quote unquote religious freedom laws are. They're religious imposition laws and they're religious imposition laws that inure to the benefit of seemingly only Christians because you're, you're not gonna see um, cases in the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court is, is allowing Muslims or Jews or Buddhists or anybody else to sort of exempt themselves in the way that they are willing to let Christian evangelicals exempt themselves because of the powerful lobbying um, because they're powerful lobbyists and they're able to ask the administration to do these things. They're able to insert themselves into the government. Under, the, under Trump, HHS was filled with right-wingers, Christian right-wingers, people who work for Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a right-wing Christian law firm that is based, all they do is sue to strip LGBTQ rights and to strip abortion rights from people. So, you know, the, the fact that the Biden administration is moving away from that is a really clear sign that we have that we can make some progress in this arena and i think that that's that's really important and then finally i would say in terms of just sex and gender rights generally you know there's this overwhelming deluge of bills that are attacking trans people that are attacking trans youth arkansas the legislature just overrode a veto that asa hutchinson uh, asa hutchinson had billed as, had vetoed a bill that strips trans youth of health care so now arkansas is saying you're not even allowed to get this kind of healthcare. And that's just wrong 
for one, um, it's a it's a departure from what the Obama administration did. The Obama administration really did make an effort to make sure that trans kids were protected. And I think that Biden can continue that work or can get back to that work under Title IX by starting to refuse federal funds to schools that don't let girls, trans girls play on girls sports team or use the proper locker room and that sort of thing. So I think that these are, I think the Biden-Harris administration has a real chance to be transformative um, but it's going to take some work because these are fraught issues for sure. But there is actually an action that President Biden can take that does not involve policy, but that would be transformative. He can say the word abortion. He has been in office now for almost 100 days and has yet to say the word abortion. Why is this important? Well, how can you actually start to um, tackle an, inverse, an, an issue or have a conversation about something if you can't even name it? There is so much stigma around abortion to begin, to begin with. Not saying the word abortion only compounds that stigma. And I think the more that we can start to include the word abortion in conversations at the highest levels of government, the more we can move toward having um, actual thoughtful um, conversations about um, abortion and the actions that need to be taken. There's a real narrative shift that needs to happen that we've been talking about. Um, but I do want to share this additional stat, which is that one in four women by the age of 45 will have had an abortion. One in four. So when you hear advocacy organizations talking about how everyone loves someone who has an abortion, that's where this comes from. Um, abortion is not some outside other issue that, you know, that most women never contemplate. Um, it is core to the reproductive health journey that we all undergo. And I think that it starts with talking about abortion and using the language. I mean, can you imagine, um, you know, President Biden issuing a statement about any other issue, whether it's trans rights or whether it's about um, preserving voting rights and not actually using the phrasing voting rights or trans rights. That's what he's been doing with abortion. He's been relying on the pro-choice framing, um, which is really just kind of a tap dance around what we're really talking about. Abortion is a medical um, um, procedure um, and it is something that should not be shied away from. And I think it will be a really important and impactful moment when he finally does say the word and I hope he, he gets to that soon. I think that silence also is what allows this disinformation and misinformation to foster so much when when there is there is really no ability to actually say say the word and what it means. Um, uh, also, I'm glad you raised the Arkansas anti-trans bill, Imani, because I, I wanted to just draw back as well when you think about imperialism, the, also the kind of corporate funders who back all of these bills, your Walmarts, your AT&Ts, um, and kind of the, the way that the, ac the access to funds is restricted at the user level, but also the funds that are being pumped in at the corporate level as well. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask both of you uh, two more questions before I open up to um, audience Q&A. One, more depressing and one more optimistic. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, the the first is really about Amy Coney Barrett. And, and you know, I know that so many aspects of her ascent to the Supreme Court have left many of us reeling. Um, and I wondered, you know, how you um, kind of process that and also at the broader level, um, how states are responding to her. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I've still, I don't think I've yet processed the fact that she's on the court. In my mind, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is just sort of haunting the court, just sort of whispering into everyone's ear. Um, but in a re very real sense, the, the ascendance of Amy Coney Barrett signaled to conservatives, signaled to anti-choice forces that now was the time to really go hard in, in attacking Roe. And, you know, as Galena mentioned earlier, um, these states are passing just patently unconstitutional bills, bills that are just so wildly unconstitutional, it makes me uncomfortable. But they, and they say out loud in the media, we know this is unconstitutional, but our goal is to get this case before the Supreme Court so that we can finally get a ruling as to whether or not Roe is still good law. Um, you're seeing a lot of states beginning to attack viability as a standard, right? Because right now the rule, the, 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 the rule is you're entitled to get an abortion up to the point of fetal viability. State cannot say you can't get an abortion before fetal viability. Now, of course, states can regulate from you know, day one up until day whatever, they're, they're allowed to regulate, which increases burdens, increases access restrictions, but they can't 
foreclose the opportunity for abortion. And so they're, so some of these states are doing really tricky things. So one of the things that just drives me crazy is that they are trying to, they are trying to make the undue, the undue burden framework set forth in Casey. They're trying to apply that framework to gestational bans. So um, let me explain what I mean by that. In Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court said, you can't throw up obstacles, substantial obstacles in the place of people seeking an abortion. You cannot unduly burden the right to an abortion. And so what an undue burden is, is a very subjective inquiry, right? Uh, is traveling 200 miles an undue burden? Is traveling 150 miles? And is requiring um, doctors to get admitting privileges at hospitals that refuse to give them? Is that an undue burden? These are all questions that a judge can answer without really looking at a lot of objective facts or by looking at objective facts and just interpreting them in a way that they find more suitable. And so, you know, the, 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 the problem with trying to force an undue burden inquiry onto gestational bans is that the court has already said that pre-viability abortion bans are inherently an undue burden. That's just the bottom line. There's no reason to go through that Planned Parenthood versus Casey analysis when it comes to, for example, a six-week abortion ban, because a six-week abortion ban is inherently an undue burden and it's unconstitutional. That's it. But they're making these arguments. They're now trying to say, well, the six-week abortion ban isn't really a ban, it's a regulation. And because it's a regulation, regulations must be, they must be sort of shoehorned into this undue burden analysis. But a ban is a ban, it's not a regulation. They're trying to say, we're not banning abortion at six weeks, we're just regulating the time period during which you can get an abortion, which is absurd, it's just semantics, it's a, it's a ban. And so they're, but they're making these arguments and trying to throw anything at the wall in the hopes that it will stick, in the hopes that Amy Coney Barrett can find something that she can hang her anti-abortion hat on and then turn that into law. Um, and the other, one of the other really alarming things, and I think that Amy Coney Barrett is just all for this, is attacking abortion providers standing to sue, right? So when you have standing to sue, it means that you're going to court, you have an injury, and you think the court can, can redress that injury. For decades, abortion providers have been filing lawsuits on behalf of themselves and on behalf of their patients. Well, now um, states, legislatures are saying, well, abortion providers shouldn't be able to sue on behalf of their patients because there's an inherent conflict of interest. Abortion providers are trying to say that these quote unquote health and safety laws are, are unconstitutional and undue burden, which means they're trying to not follow the health and safety protocol that we, Texas, for example, have imposed. And that's just nonsense. That's nonsense. Abortion providers are some of the most compassionate people, especially because they're working in a field that is actually life-threatening to them. We're talking about people who have to wear Kevlar to work. And so having states argue that providers are inherently opposed to their patients' interests just increases abortion stigma and increases harassment and increases clinic violence. And I think that that's really dangerous. And to me, Amy Coney Barrett is really the culmination of a long, um, a, a long tail strategy adopted by the Republican Party to reshape the federal judiciary. Um, in fact, last year we started up a franchise called Trump Judges because Trump was filling vacancies so fast, so fast with so many terrible um, nominees that we wanted to start exploring what the impact would mean for us um, and our rights for decades to come. I mean, Trump. Um, uh, ran through more than 200 nominations with the, uh, with the help of Senator Mitch McConnell. And we cannot overstate the, the damage that was done to the court system as a result and um, the ramifications of that um, in terms of the rollback of our rights that we're going to be seeing, um, quite frankly, for the next generation. And, and Amy Coney Barrett, she's just the pinnacle of that. She's just you know the culmination of that strategy, getting her on the court. And it is something we should all be concerned about. And you definitely, um, you mentioned that uh, President Biden has announced his, his uh, first slate of, of nominations uh, for the federal judiciary. And it's certainly encouraging to see him right out of the gate taking this on as the important issue that it is, but it's gonna take a long time to undo that damage. Thank you both so much. I'm gonna open up for audience questions because I'm sure many folks um, would love to, to, to pose some questions to you both. Um, 
So do go ahead folks and, and post your questions in the chat um, and I'll read them out in full. Um, our first question is from Barbie Zelizer. Um, she says, wow, thank you all for a terrifically illuminating discussion. It's hard as a media scholar to let go of your very important point of constructed polarization in regards to the framing of abortion or in Biden's case, not calling it by name. <laughs> do you see this as emblematic of other marginalized issues? And if so, what might be the shared characteristics of what else gets demeaned by this process in the media and refuse a medical slash health framing? I wonder too, if the inability to recognize a health frame draws from most journalists own lack of expertise in the area. Sorry, just right, I'll do. Go ahead, Amani. <laughs> Go ahead, Amani. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that abortion is one of those areas that sort of the people, people who sort of toil in the abortion world are just constantly doing it, right? Jess and I, I've been doing it for a decade. Jess has been doing it longer. And we are so ensconced in these issues that I think it becomes difficult for us to sort of step outside the abortion world and view it from how mainstream, just ordinary people would do, non-lawyers, non-abortion advocates, how they view it. And I think that goes, this, that, that, I think that counts as well for the media because the media tends to focus on abortion when there's a huge bill, right? When there's a 20 week ban in play or when Alabama um, bans abortion, but they are not really so tapped into the issue that they're able to, to sort of talk about it in the right way. And so what we end up, what ends up happening is that abortion is sort of talked about and treated as if it's not healthcare, is treated as if it's something other than healthcare. And then that framing sort of just percolates throughout the media. And so you have, you know, Jess and I and other people at Rewire News Group, some of our freelancers and our staff writers who are desperately trying to push back on that narrative, but we're a small organization. It's going to be hard for us to sort of go up against the New York Times and the Washington Post and some of these other mainstream publications that frequently, they don't, that not only report in inaccurate information at some times, but report it in a framing from the anti-choice side, right? Even the, the simple fact of calling these people pro-life is, is, is discussing this from the framing of the anti-choicers because pro-choice people are also pro-life, right? And I, and I would argue that a lot of anti-choicers aren't pro-life, they're pro-birth. So I think that the more that we can begin talking about abortion in a healthcare framing and encouraging people in the media to talk about it, to, to you know, call members of the media in when they talk about it incorrectly and sort of correct them in a nice way so that we can you know, not make people angry so that we can actually connect to people. I think that that's really important. And I, yeah, I do think it does stem a lot from some journalist's lack of experience in this area. I mean, it's a difficult area. It's an area that I've spent the last 10 years learning and I'm st I still don't know everything. Um, and so you, it's really hard to expect a journalist who isn't on the repro beat to understand all of the ins and outs of these laws and the ways in which abortion is framed, talked about and legislated. But I think even beyond that, something that we've that's become very clear these last few years is that most media outlets don't know how to handle it when folks outright lie to them. And when there's just a bombardment of lying, right? Think of how media outlets struggled to cover from day one, the inauguration false reporting of how there were there had never been crowds that size at the inauguration, despite photographic evidence to the, con to the contrary. Think of how the media twisted themselves into a pretzel trying to figure out how to reconcile the official statement, the lie, with what they knew to be true. And think of all of the moments during the Trump era when that proved to be true. Now, look at what how this has been happening in abortion all for, for more than 10 years, an, an issue that is undercover, that is not covered by the right people. The lies just get reported, right? Right alongside the truth. And so you don't know how to distinguish between fact and fiction anymore. And that's really what has happened with this narrative. And, you know, even, you know, seeing how the media reports on these pieces of, of legislation that be, are being intru introduced and, you know, quoting um, state senators saying, we are doing this to protect the health and safety of women and presenting that as, you know, oh, this is why they're doing it and not in any way trying to parse that or break that down or to point out how this is completely flies in the face of the health and safety of the very population they are purporting to help. I mean, there's just has not been that kind of rigorous um, analysis and questioning and pushback 
um, because the lies have been so blatant, have been so overwhelming, have been so consistent that it has almost become an adopted part of the narrative. And, um, you know, and I don't think we ever thought that this could happen in general, but it has happened in general. And it has all, and it all has its, root, its roots in what was happening, you know, a decade ago in this space. And also, you know, to answer one of the other questions that Barbie posed about whether or not this is emblematic of other marginalized issues, I think it definitely is. If you look at the way that the media is talking about trans healthcare, right? We've got Arkansas that has just banned trans healthcare for trans, uh, banned healthcare for trans youth. We've got a lot of cisgendered white men who are making very loud proclamations about puberty blockers and hormone treatments. They don't know what they're talking about, but they are able to sort of coat their Honestly, it's a lot of it is bigotry in this thin veneer of concern, right? Like, I, I'm not transphobic. I'm just concerned about trans youth. Are we are we pushing trans youth too far into quote transgenderism when maybe they may they maybe in a few years they'll grow out of it? As if being trans is a phase. As if trans youth kids don't know what's going on with their own bodies, their own gender identities. It's not painted as a healthcare issue. It's painted as a cultural issue, and abortion suffers from that same problem not a healthcare issue, it's a cultural issue. Both of them are healthcare treating issues. politicians as experts on these issues right. when they truly prove time and time again that they know nothing. Right. <laughs> not and even treating, basic biology. <laughs> right, and treating white cisgender men as experts on trans issues to the exclusion of actual trans people who are speaking about their own experiences. I think that's really problematic. And I think in a way that links back to the statistics Galena was sharing at the beginning about how very few women who've had an abortion are quoted in articles about abortion and, and the way in which basic journalistic practices of getting quotations from different sides of, of an argument seem to be devoid from, from coverage of, of reproductive rights. Um, we have a question um, from Richard Stupart that says, thanks so much for such an incredible conversation on Galena's observation about the media struggling to cope with outright lying. Do you see or hope for a change in reproductive health coverage out of the lessons learned by the media post-Trump? Um, I wish I could be that hopeful, um, but I think truly until um, the lens in which abortion is covered um, changes, we're not going to see any kind of change and until we start to draw the connections between abor abortion and gender equity. Um, we are not going to see the conversation change until we have a president who can say the abortion, the word abortion, we are not going to see a change. I mean, we see just, you know, the stigma runs so deep and is so widespread that, you know, it, it, it's, it, there needs to be a conscious decision to overhaul this narrative and it requires multiple changes to be made. Um, I would love to see mainstream media outlets start to staff um, healthcare reporters when covering abortion. Um, I, you know, we've been waiting a long time for that. And again, you know, I'd also love to say that Rewire News Group, we're just part of this big community covering this issue, you know, and we're not. We are often the only voice out there talking about these through the patient and provider lens. Um, and I don't see that changing for a long time, unfortunately. And I think even when you read, when you go on the Rewire website, you see news that isn't being covered anywhere else. You see these really important stories and, and scientific stories about reproductive developments and reproductive technologies. And you think I haven't seen this in any other news organization. So it's yeah. really amazing. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a, a question from um, Gina Seibert saying, thank you so much for this. I was wondering what role the pandemic has played in either your approach to covering abortion access and reproductive rights, or perhaps if it's been used rhetorically by opponents to attack or distort those issues. And I know that makes me think about the Arkansas, Arkansas banning the telemedicine for abortion pills. Um, so kind of also I would tack on a question around like what, what else is being added to the, the fuel to the fire of, of anti-abortion activists under COVID. Yeah, anti-abortion activists really sort of exploited the pandemic to further their anti-choice goals. And it's it was really, it was really gross in a way because we were, you know, right in the throes of the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, we were already more than a year into it, but in the beginning, we didn't know much about COVID. And so, you know, there was the shortage of, of PPE and, you know, there were healthcare workers who were just drowning in, in work and trying to care for these patients. And rather than trying to help the healthcare workers by, for example, imposing lockdowns that would have, you know, gotten more people off the street, kept people at home, kept people out of hospitals. What you had is you had uh, states, governors, even mayors refusing lockdowns, 
but then saying, or even imposing lockdowns, but then exempting clinics and clinic protesters from those lockdowns. So clinic protesters were perfectly allowed to go into a clinic, to go stick their head in people's cars, unmasked, try and get people to not go into that abortion clinic. That was fine. That was some, somehow a it, disallowing them to do that would somehow be an infringement on their religious liberty. At the same time, they were making completely outlandish and untrue claims about the ways in which abortion clinics are using a PPE that could otherwise go to healthcare workers who are fighting COVID when they weren't. They don't use a lot of PPE and there's no PPE that needs to be used besides a mask when you're doing medication abortion, right? You're just handing out pills. And the fact that so many states and there's even a case right now at the Supreme Court about whether or not a, a patient has to go in person to pick up a pill or whether they can just get on you know, a Zoom call or a Skype call and talk to their doctor, get instructions on how to take the pill and then, and then complete their abortion at home. And this just goes back to the ways in which abortion is regulated in a way that other healthcare, um, other healthcare procedures are not. And so, yeah, the anti-choicers have really, really exploited the pandemic, tried to make abort, you know, try to further stigmatize providers as people who were unwilling to do their part in the COVID pandemic because they think that people still need abortions. Well, yeah, I mean, abortion is healthcare. You wouldn't say, oh, those oncologists are really screwing everything up because they keep insisting on seeing cancer patients. You know, we don't talk about abortion or we don't talk about any other kind of healthcare the way that we talk about abortion and maybe trans healthcare and that's it. So in terms of the way that we cover it, we just made a point to insist that abortion providers are doing the best that they can under difficult circumstances, that it was incumbent on states and states and the federal government to make it easier for them by, for example, permitting telehealth, telemedicine, and that abortion providers are honestly some of the greatest people I've ever met. They do this very compassionate work under very difficult circumstances in an environment where people are constantly harassing them, constantly, you know, the, the, the clinic violence, especially in the wake of, of the, the Trump administration has just been out of hand. And I think that anti-choicers have a real responsibility to try to rein that in. I know they won't, but it would be nice if they would because it's dangerous, not just the patients who have to deal with perhaps COVID infected people at protests, but also to providers who are then, who are having more stigma heaped on them. I also think the pandemic was a great microcosm or maybe a macrocosm if that's even a word of what happens when you politicize a healthcare issue. Think about the recommendation to wear a mask. This is a scientific recommendation to protect yourself and others. This is good medical policy. What happened when it became politicized is that you can't get people to wear masks. You put you increase dangers, you have more deaths. Well, I think that that's a great thing to keep in mind when we think about abortion and how politica politicized it is. It puts people's lives in danger. Um, and I think that going forward, we really need to be looking at abortion through the lens, again, of patients and of healthcare, because otherwise you create this incredibly dangerous situation that serves no one. Um, I'm going to take a moment to ask a final question. Um, I, I, um, I think I'm not a scientist, but it feels like we're on the cusp or in a moment where there are really exciting kind of advances in in um, our ability to control our own reproductive rights from, as you're mentioning, kind of self-managed abortion through abortion pills, missed period pills, emergency um, contraception. And I just wondered, kind of looking into the future, what do you see as some of the more interesting or exciting or um, potentially liberatory elements of, of the kind of future of, of reproductive technologies? Um, I think generally it's really important. First of all, I think it's really important to make assisted reproductive technology less classist because what we have right now is a situation where a lot of people aren't able to afford, if you are, if people who are suffering from infertility, they're not able to afford IVF. It's so expensive. Um, but beyond, beyond that, I think that it's really critical to um, end restrictions on telehealth, right? To end restrictions around medication abortion. I think that especially in the wake of the pandemic, more people are choosing self-managed abortion. We actually did a big um, content, a special issue, I guess it was February now, about medication abortion and about how medication abortion is the, is the future of abortion because it's so much easier. People can do it on their own time and it would go 
you know, uh, Jessica talks constantly about, you know, points of access and addressing geographical disparities in access, allowing medication abortion to just flourish and thrive would really take care of these problems. It would ameliorate the problems of people, for example, in rural areas who don't have access to clinics, who have to drive hundreds of miles to get to a clinic or even to a hospital. Um, and I think that, you know, when you talk about, you know, the future of reproductive technology, you know, you, you can't help think about, you know, artificial wombs. I mean, I feel like artificial wombs are, are just anti-choicers you know, that's just, just the pinnacle, right? If they can make, if they can sort of normalize, if they can, first of all, get it to the point where artificial rooms are, wombs are common and are used and they can normalize it, that's good for some people who are suffering from infertility. It's bad to the extent that they are going to use that as further evidence that people should not be able to get abortions because we can just take the, the take the fetus in your womb and implant it into this into this artificial womb, which means now we can just criminalize abortion because you don't need it. And I think that you know it's up to every person to decide what they want to do with their body. Do they want to have whatever's in their body implanted into an artificial womb? Maybe, maybe not. That's not a decision that should be left up to legislators. And then, and finally, I think that it's really important to integrate healthcare and abortion care, right? Just smash them together because they're the same thing, right? Abortion is healthcare. And so if we can, there are birthing centers, for example, Choices. We did a, a podcast and a series on that, Rewire News Group did. And, you know, this is a, a new birth, a new-ish birthing center in Memphis, Tennessee that offers a panoply of reproductive services, reproductive healthcare services. And I think that that is really important and key, especially when we're talking about access. If we can find, we can start doing more pop-up birthing centers that offer everything from abortion to childbirth. I think that's better for people who are able to become pregnant. I think there's certainly a lot of exciting disruption happening in this space on the healthcare front. I would love to see a similar kind of disruption happening in the coverage of these issues and on the media front. Thank you both so much. Um, and thank you so much for this discussion today. I think I'll wrap up considering the time. Um, this panel has been so helpful, even just for me in processing these kind of contradictory moments that we're having right now in this space. Um, I wanted to thank Barbie. Um, Zelza, Emily Plowman, Joanna Berkner from the Center of Media at Risk for making this panel happen. And thanks so much to everyone in the audience for your attention and for your questions. Um, and, and go listen to the best podcast ever, Boom Lawyered. <laughs> Thank you all so much for this opportunity. We appreciate all of the support. And yes, go listen to Boom Lawyered. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs>